and welcome to Palm Vista Community Church as we launch a new series in the book of Revelation. I want to turn your eyes back to verse 1, so if we could display verse 1 again. I want you to notice how this book begins. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. The book of Revelation is a revelation by Jesus of Jesus. Do I have your attention? This is a revelation by Jesus of Jesus. Can there be anything more important on this earth? This this revelation by Jesus of Jesus was written in a context of great, great suffering that the church was encountering because they refused to say these simple words, Caesar is Lord. In the Roman Empire of the first century, you could get along by going along, by just going by the altar, throwing a little incense in there like everybody else, and just saying, Caesar is Lord. It was cool. You could still say Jesus was Lord. The Romans were all polytheists. They were happy to say Caesar is Lord along with everybody else. Christian, just get along. Say this phrase, and we'll leave you alone. They couldn't. Because, see, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So they couldn't. And in particularly to these seven churches, which we will see shortly in a map, not yet, but in a moment, the rulers of Asia Minor, what today is called modern-day Turkey, really wanted to get in good with Caesar back in Rome. And so they really came down hard on this emperor cult or this emperor worship. So they were being persecuted. And in the midst of the persecution, Jesus says to John, who was on an island because he wouldn't say Caesar is Lord, he says, I'm going to reveal myself to you. I want you to write it down. I want you to send this prophetic vision to these seven churches And I want you to be my faithful witnesses and to be courageous in making disciples with the gospel. And that is the title of the series. Steadfast, courageous discipleship on the edge of eternity. Steadfast, courageous discipleship on the edge of eternity. The church has always been on the edge of eternity. The eternity is now in the blink of an eye. And he's calling us to be steadfast, courageously making disciples on the edge of eternity. And this morning's message is entitled, Faithful Witness. Faithful Witness. Our text is the one that David just read, Revelation 1, 1 to 20. Church, what makes a faithful witness? If you read online the Department of Justice if you read the National Law Review, if you go to private law firms, they tell you what makes a faithful or credible witness. Here's what they say. Number one, you have to be knowledgeable. You must know either the subject or the event to which you are witnessing. And number two, you must be confident. You must be knowledgeable. You must be confident. Revelation was written to a church under great pressure that they might be knowledgeable and they might be confident in Jesus. Just as in a courtroom, the faithful or credible witness must be knowledgeable and must be confident under extremely hostile cross-examination. So the church, down through the ages, must be knowledgeable. They must see Jesus and know Jesus and then be confident under incredibly hostile cross-examination. To not flinch back, to not pull their punch, but to say, I trust Jesus, and I'm going to tell you about Jesus because I've seen Jesus. See, Jesus reveals himself 
to his church as his faithful witnesses. That's the argument of this text, I believe. I believe this argument frames the entire book of Revelation on the screen. Here's the argument we're going to make this morning from the text. Jesus reveals his glory to his faithful witnesses. Jesus reveals his glory to his faithful witnesses. John gets this prophetic vision. It really starts in verse 9, and it goes all the way through. In the next couple of weeks, John is going to deliver prophetic visions to seven churches. We will be preaching these seven messages, these seven prophetic visions. And and by and large, chapter 1 is doxological. Chapter 1 is doxological. That's a fancy way for saying that chapter 1 is about praise to Jesus Christ. Doxology. It's doxological. And that's going to be the main point here from our text this morning. It's doxological. But chapter 1 is also practical. Because see, chapter 1 sets up chapters 2 through the end of the book. There, There is a practical aspect of seeing Jesus and praising Jesus, doxology, so then we can share Jesus, bear witness of Jesus, be faithful witnesses of Christ. Must be knowledgeable, must be confident. So in our message this morning, we're going to have two points. The first point is the doxological point. It's the longer of the two points. It's seeing Jesus. And the second point is going to be the practical point, sharing Jesus. It's smaller. It's anticipatory of what's coming in the message series in the future. Point one, see Jesus. On the screen, Revelation 1, 4a, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Let's get the geographical context, shall we, church? On the screen, there should be a map there, and that map, in the center of that map, you'll see the word Asia. That word Asia is describing modern-day Turkey. To the far left of that map, you see Macedonia and Achaia. That's modern-day Greece. We just finished our series in 2 Corinthians to the church in southern Greece in Achaia, Corinth. And to the right of Asia, you'll see Galatia, Cappadocia. That's modern-day Syria if you come around south on the right-hand side. And then, of course, modern-day Israel there where you see Judea. So Asia is kind of right in the middle. And the seven churches to whom Paul or John is writing are in Asia. And John is in exile on the island of Patmos. You may not be able to see this unless you have really good eyesight, but to the left of where it says Caria, C-A-R-I-A, below Asia, there's an island in the Aegean Sea called Patmos. And that is where John is located. These seven churches, if you can see them on the map, keep the map up there, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Smyrna, Thyatira, Uh, These seven churches are are representative of all the churches in all history. Laodicea, Pergamum. The number seven is the number of fullness. So yes, he's writing specifically to seven churches that were specifically in great turmoil because of the testimony of Jesus to be faithful witnesses. But he's writing to all the churches through all time. He's revealing Christ to these seven churches And thank God these seven churches faithfully revealed Christ to other churches. And down through the centuries, Christ has had his faithful witnesses who haven't flinched back, who haven't thrown in the incense into the fire and said, Caesar is Lord, whatever that is in that generation. We all know what it is today, right? But they say, no, Jesus is Lord. And so I'm going to be a faithful witness, knowledgeable of him. I see him and confident in him. I trust him down to today. And so we are those faithful witnesses. This this is written to us. This is a prophetic vision to you and me. And I want you to see the first thing that Jesus says or tells John to say to the church. Back on the screen, Revelation 1, 4b to 5a. Grace to you and peace from him who is. You ready to see Jesus? You ready to see God? You're going to see a Trinitarian view of God here. Grace to you and peace from whom? From him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings 
on earth. Back to 4b, grace and peace. Grace. The church needed much grace as they were being grilled on the witness stand of culture. They were being grilled with hostile cross-examination. And they were being tempted to, to kind of compromise a little bit. But grace comes to them. And peace. Not only were they being grilled, they were being killed. They were being grilled and killed. Did you know that Timothy was most probably beaten to death in Asia because he wouldn't say Caesar is Lord? John was sent to Patmos probably because he was so well-known they didn't want to make him a martyr. But there were many like Timothy that were beaten to death, grilled. You better say Caesar is Lord, whatever it is today. Who is this Jesus? And then killed. Oh, you won't? Then we'll kill you. We'll cancel you. We'll end your employment. Fill in the blank. Ultimately, they're killed. So the grace of God and the peace of God. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He gives us a peace the world cannot take away from us, even when they're grilling and killing us, because they did, the world did not give us this peace. And then, who is this Jesus? Who is God? is what we're saying here. Let's look at it. 4b. From him who is and who was and who is to come. Most probably this comes from Exodus 3.14. And this is speaking of God the Father. Exodus 3.14 is where God, in 1400 BC, 1400 years before this was written, revealed himself to Moses who he would use to call his people out of Egypt and the tyrant Pharaoh. <clears throat> and when Moses said, who's sending me? He said, I am who I am. You want to see Jesus? You want to see God? He is the sovereign. I am who I am. I can care for you over any other sovereign, any other ruler, any other tyrant, whether it's Pharaoh and Egypt in 1400 BC, whether it's Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon in 500 BC, or whether it's Caesar and Rome in the first century, or whether it's whoever else you're thinking of right now that is opposing God, therefore is opposing God's people. He's saying, I am who I am. I can care for you. Next. Back to 4b. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Again, seven is a number of completion, a number of fullness. Most likely here, I believe it's referring to the Holy Spirit. Later in the book, you will see references to the Holy Spirit. This is God the Holy Spirit. This is most likely a reference to Zechariah 4, 2 through 9. No time to look there. By the way, Revelation has more Old Testament quotes in it than any other book in the New Testament. So a fun thing to do is, if you have children, sit them down at the table and say, let's hunt for all of the Old Testament references here. And in your Bible, you'll see these cross-references. If you have a study Bible, you can, you can be, begin reading the Old Testament and then how it's fulfilled in the New Testament in Christ. And this is one of them. This is God the Holy Spirit who empowers us to stand in faith when we're being grilled and killed. And then finally, 5a. And from Jesus Christ on the screen, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To include Caesar in that day. To include whatever ruler today that you're afraid of or you're worried about. Oh, what a picture of Jesus Listen, if you're not a Christian, if you're watching this, I hope you're watching this. I pray that God leads you to this. Here comes the gospel. Here comes the gospel. If you're a Christian and you're wondering, what's the gospel? Here is the gospel. It shines brightly right here. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. How can I be a faithful witness? I can only be a faithful witness because Jesus is a faithful witness. But there's more than that here. This is a quote from the Old Testament. This is a quote from Psalm 89. 
That one you can look up later today for sure. Psalm 89, verses 27 and 37. And it's pointing, probably written in 1000 BC, it's pointing down the quarters of time, and John is saying that psalm is pointing to Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. And, it's, and he's saying this Jesus is that faithful witness of whom the psalmist wrote in Psalm 89. And what that means is this, that he is the first born of the dead. There's the gospel. Why is he the faithful witness? Because he's the firstborn from the dead. And he's the ruler of kings. So let me put all that together for you. Not being Jewish, you might not be aware of this, that the Jews have had a hope of a king who would reign on the throne of David forever and ever and ever. And he would establish a kingdom and he would defeat all his enemies. And they didn't understand how that would happen. But for centuries, they'd been waiting for this king. And and the psalmist is prophesying about this king in Psalm 89. And John is saying that Jesus is that king. That Jesus, the one who we see, the one who we have confidence in, we're knowledgeable of and see, the one whose witness we faithfully bear, the one for whom we are willing to die, to be grilled and killed because we won't say that Caesar is, is Lord, is that king. And he on the cross and in his resurrection has inaugurated, has established a new creation. If you're not a Christian, This is what we call conversion. God the Son inaugurated or made possible a new creation. God the Holy Spirit applies the work of God the Son to give us life. But what he's saying to the believers in the first century and to us today is that Jesus inaugurates this new creation and he inaugurates his kingdom and he makes you part of that kingdom. So bear faithful witness of him. He is Lord. And that's what that last section of 5b says on the screen. The ruler of kings on earth. The ruler of kings on earth. Those kings are not the friends of God. Those kings are the enemy of God. Those kings are Pharaoh. Those kings are Nebuchadnezzar. Those kings are Caesar. Those kings are whomever you think of today that opposes God, that opposes God's people. Jesus is the ruler of them. How comforting that must have been to these poor Christians being beaten to death, being tormented, being thrown to wild animals. Jesus is the king over that king, Emperor Caesar, who is doing this to you. Jesus is the king over whatever political entity you're afraid of, whatever side of the aisle you're on. Jesus is king. He is king over every force in the heavens, under the earth, on the earth. It doesn't matter. Jesus is king. We can trust him. He is the ruler and king over the final enemy, death. I so appreciated the word today. Sergio said, I think I have a word about Jesus being king over death and ruling over death. And every song we sang is about Jesus being king over death. And I'm going into surgery tomorrow, so I'm glad he's king over death. Because they're putting me down, man, general anesthesia. And I won't won't lie to you, church. I'm nervous. Because they always have to tell you the 5,000 things that can go wrong, right? Thank you very much for that encouraging word. Here, sign all these documents. But I was worshiping this morning, saying, okay, Lord Jesus, I love you. I'd like to wake up tomorrow here and see my wife. But if I wake up tomorrow in heaven and see you, that'd be great. I know, I'm melodramatic. What can I say? It's your diva pastor here. Um, But it's true, isn't it? That's why Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Because last time I checked, Caesar's dead. And look at, look at verse 5b now on the screen, please. Revelation 1, 5b and 6. Oh my. Here's where John goes into doxology mode, which is just a fancy way of saying he starts shouting and jumping. Don't you love the worship team? Like, you know, whatever they were doing here. They, they, you know, they, John just starts doing this in 5b and 6. Read it with me. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. Hallelujah. By his blood. That's the gospel, firstborn from the dead, because he died on the cross, bled on the cross for, to free us from our sins, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Do you see Jesus? Do you know him? 
who freed you from your sins by his blood, by his sacrifice? Do you see Jesus who's brought you into his kingdom and made you a priest in his kingdom? Do you see the gospel? Oh, I pray you do. And if you're not a Christian, I pray you would bow your knee to this Jesus. You would profess him as Lord. That it would be true of you that by his blood he's freed you from your sins, from death and eternal punishment, from the bondage of sin, Satan, and death. Just as God freed Israel from Pharaoh and Egypt, so Jesus frees us from sin and Satan and death. Pharaoh and Egypt were but a picture, weak picture of Satan, sin, and death. And Jesus won the victory over them. Look at verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him on the cross, he was pierced. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Two more Old Testament quotes. Write these down. Very important quotes. When it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. That is a quote from Daniel 7.13. Daniel 7.13. Daniel, speaking some 600, 500 years earlier, sees this vision of a son of man. This Christ figure, this Messiah, this king, this one everybody's hoping for. And he's coming in the clouds. And what Daniel is saying is that this Christ, this Christ is going to be enthroned over all kings, over all rulers. He rules over every king. Remember we read that earlier. And so John is saying, because Jesus is telling him, I'm that one. I'm the one coming in the clouds. What that means is that I rule over every single king and every single kingdom to include the Caesar and the kingdom of Rome that is oppressing you right now, Christian, and for us today. And then the second quote is the second part of this verse. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. This is a quote from Zechariah. 12, 10. Zechariah wrote after Daniel. Zechariah 12, 10. And this again is this prophecy of the coming Messiah. And it's a prophecy of Israel seeing him and then wailing or repenting and saying, I'm so sorry, Lord, and being grafted back in or being accepted back in by the Lord. The difference here is if you read our text, put it back up there. It says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and Israel? What's it say next? All tribes. See, this is the gospel now accelerating. This is now the gospel that we see in shadows in the Old Testament, now going on hyperdrive. This is the gospel when Sam Miller drives his little sports car, okay? It's when he, when he hits the gas and downshifts and just takes off. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. This is, this is the whole world. This is Jesus, who's not just come for Israel, but now all of his people. And then look at verse 8. I love it, David, when you... David went hyperdrive on this one when he read it, and I'm glad he did. Verse 8. Jesus now is saying to John, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Not Caesar, not whatever party you voted for in last election, not whatever power has all the oil or all the gold or all that was filling the blanks and whatever it is, not any ruler that you're reading about or looking at, not even a storm that destroys so much. No, I am the Almighty. And, and, and this passage is saying that he's the Alpha and the Omega. That means he rules from the beginning to the end. I can have confidence in him. This is who he is. I'm knowledgeable of him, and I have confidence in him. Jesus rules from the beginning of my life to whenever it's going to end. So we see Jesus. That's the main part. That's the longer of the two points. 
but it's to prepare us to share Jesus. Point two, we're going to actually see this more and more in the seven prophetic visions to the seven churches starting next week, but it's found here in one little verse. It's tucked away in verse six. Point two, share Jesus. Look at, let's go back to verse six. And made us a kingdom, comma, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I believe that John here was making a strong allusion to Exodus 19.6. Exodus 19.6 on the screen. This was written by Moses in 1400 B.C. after God had taken his people out of Egypt and Pharaoh and is now constituting them as his people at Mount Sinai, giving them the law and the covenant and all the sacrifices. And he says, this is who you are. Exodus 19.6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So what God said is, I want you to be a kingdom of priests, i.e., priests represent God to man and man to God. But in this case, God to man, and I want you to be a holy nation because I want you to image me to the nations. Israel was to image God to the nations as a holy nation, calling them to repent and believe in Christ, and they failed. Read the Old Testament. Read about the exodus, uh, excuse me, the, the exile into Babylon. They failed, but they always had this hope. And now what John is saying is Jesus has come and he is now the one who is going to make you those kingdom of priests. And how can I say that? Because Peter, the apostle Peter, picks up on the same language in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Church, this is who we are. See Jesus so that we can share Jesus. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's a quote from Exodus 19.6. I believe that's what John is alluding to here in our text in 1.6. A people for his own possession. Why? That you may proclaim, see Jesus, share Jesus, the excellencies of him, Jesus, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people. That's right, we weren't. We were Gentiles. But now, but now, you are God's people. God reconstitutes Israel in the church. The church is the Israel of God. God says, this is my covenant people. No longer ethnically Jews, but now all nations, every tribe, every people. Us. Praise God. But you are, you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Church, we are a real priesthood. We are a holy nation. And Jesus is saying, see me so that you don't compromise either the message, you don't bow your knee and say Caesar is Lord, whatever that is for you, and you don't live a lifestyle that's compromised, that's against my word. You're not endorsing and doing things that are patently against my word. You are able to be a faithful witness, knowledgeable of who I am, and you're confident in me, and you're courageous, and even if it means your life, even if it means your employment, even if it means whatever, you're going to be a faithful witness. You're going to mediate my blessing, says Christ, to the nations. That was always God's plan. See, Jesus Jesus executed his priestly role by dying on the cross in weakness and being raised by the power of God so that he would fulfill the, the word of God. Jesus is the faithful witness. Then he makes us faithful witnesses. So as the church now, we're identified with Christ as priests in his kingdom, exercising that role by being faithful witnesses to the world and our willingness to suffer for Christ. Don't you see that? That's how we bear witness, by suffering by embracing the cross, by being that holy nation, that royal priesthood, by defeating the strategies of the enemy while appearing to suffer apparent defeat. That was the church in Asia. It's always been the church down through the century. The church is at its best, not when it's ruling politically. No way. It's when it's suffering. Bearing testimony to the suffering Savior who rose from the dead. So take heart, Christian. Be a faithful witness as you courageously disciple. See Jesus and share Jesus 
as his faithful witnesses. And how can we do that, church? I think there's no better way than through communion. When Jesus was on earth, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Yes, do this so that you would see me, so that you can share me. Listen, we're going to share Jesus right now. Church, I've been sharing him through the word of God. We're going to share him through this this Lord's table, the Lord's supper, this covenantal meal that we share together. It's, It's a visualization. Jesus knew we needed that so that we can see Jesus and share Jesus. But the truth behind these elements is who Jesus is. And as the ushers are moving to the front here to prepare to serve our hearts, I must tell you, as your pastor, that we have to prepare our hearts. We have to repent. Are you with me? We have to repent. Jesus is here, and he promises that he sets you free. I'm a little echoey here. I don't know what's going on right now. Jesus is here, and and he promises that he forgives you, and he pardons you, but he pardons and forgives those who come to him and ask for it and repent. Listen to the word of God, church. And I'm speaking to myself. 1 John 1, John wrote this. 1 John 1, 5 through 9. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, We have fellowship with one another. Amen. Listen, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Frees us from sin. Look, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But praise God for verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So church, I want to lead you in an exercise right now. If you'd bow your head and do business with God. I'm going to be reading a prayer from the Psalter hymnal that can help us repent. But you don't don't need help. The Holy Spirit's your helper. But sometimes it it can benefit some to hear this. But you do business with God. You let the Spirit of God lead you to repent and say, Lord, please forgive me. With the assurance that he does, he always forgives those who come to him humbly and say, please forgive me, Lord. Please bow your heads. Most holy and merciful Father, We confess to you and to one another that we have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had in us the mind of Christ. You alone know how often we have grieved you by wasting your gifts, by wandering from your ways. Forgive us, we pray you, most merciful Father, and free us from our sin. Renew in us the grace and strength of your Holy Spirit for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Church, we rejoice. Not yet, guys. Church, we rejoice. (laughs) Sorry. Church, you would think on the amen that it would be time, right, Mickey? I'm sorry. Not yet. Church, we rejoice in the forgiveness of our sins in Christ. But before we distribute these elements, I must issue forth a respectful appeal. That these elements are for those who have fallen at the feet of Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings, and repented of their sins and professed faith in him as their Lord and Savior. If you have not repented, if you have not made this profession of faith, then with with the utmost of love, I I appeal to you, please just let this plate go by you. And as it does, I pray that Jesus would reveal himself to you and that you would appropriately respond to him. And if you want to speak to one of us afterward, please, we'd love to speak with you. In the final verses of chapter 1, John records for us this incredible revelation of who Jesus is. In a moment, when the ushers serve us, during that, I'm going to read to you the final part of this revelation. David read it on the front end. We're going to close with this final revelation, this prophetic vision of Jesus. What better place for it to be penned 
than from heaven. From heaven? I thought Jesus was on the island of Patmos. Yes, physically. But if you read the text, he was taken up into heaven to see the throne room of God. What better place to write this word of encouragement to a a bunch of first century Christians who were literally being grilled and killed because they were faithful witnesses of Christ. And to 21st century Christians who more and more, when we fail to bow our knee and say, Caesar is Lord, whatever that is today, we're being grilled and there may come a time that we'll be killed. But Jesus is Lord. See, the Lord Jesus brought John into the heavenly throne room to reveal to us how great he is. When you read these, when you hear them and see them on the screen, you're going to see some pretty fantastic images. This is first century literature. In the first century, when you were a king, you commissioned writers and poets to create the most audacious images of you, to describe you in the greatest, craziest, most glorifying ways. Because you were so great. You were a great Caesar, a great Pharaoh. Jesus trumps them all. The images you're going to hear in a moment are designed to make you go, wow. Because he's the only one who deserves wow. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Ushers, would you begin to serve us? And as they do, on the screen, Revelation 1, 9 through 19. Revelation 9, excuse me, 1, 9 to 19. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Yeah, we need trumpets. We need trumpets, don't we? If you play the trumpet, come see us. We need trumpets up here. I heard this loud voice like a, like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. This is Daniel's son of man. Clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And with his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, but behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. I own them. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place. Church, take and eat 